everybody, it's Steve here from uh, City Hill Church in Hillcrest. Great to be sharing with you today. Uh, um, for those who don't know me, I'm married to Jackie. We have three amazing children, Levi and Ethan, who are 16 and 14 respectively, and then Trinity, who is seven years old. Today I'd like to speak about developing a higher view of God. Developing a higher view of God. This morning I went for a walk and there was a beautiful sunrise and I looked at the sun very, very briefly, but noticed, because we've had some rain recently, noticed the sun's rays hitting me, shining on the green grass all around and on the path in front of me. But if I was to try and study the sun, just with my naked human eyes, to try and figure out what the sun was like, I would not be able to do it. Just a tiny a split second looking at the sun is enough to really hurt your eyeballs. And uh, although we enjoy all of its benefit, it's very difficult to look directly at the sun and figure out more what the sun is like. And in exactly the same way, it is very difficult for any one of us to know more of what God is like because He is so different to every single one of us. I came across an analogy which I thought really helped explain this idea properly. The, the word theology means, if you break it down into its um, root words, the study of God. Ology, the study of, and theos, God. And that's a really kind of interesting word, the study of God, because God is impossible to study fully as he is in himself. Imagine for a minute that you were a scientist and that your particular area of expertise was studying ants. So you go around and every day you collect an ant, you put it on the little slide, you shove it under the microscope, and you are studying the ant through the microscope. You'd learn a whole lot about that ant. But imagine for a minute, if you will, that you were the ant. And one day, as you're being loaded up on the microscope slide, you have this bright idea. Let me try and study the scientist. Let me find out as much as I can know about the scientist. Now, because you've got a tiny ant brain, and because of your limited view, you can only look back at the scientist through the tube of the microscope. And all you've got to see of the scientist is the, scientist is the tiny little bit of his eyeball you could come to know some of the scientists, but you could definitely not know all there is to know about what the scientist is like. And in exactly the same way, it's easy to say, I have a relationship with God, I'm getting to know him better. But we are infinitely smaller than the ant, and God is infinitely greater than the scientist by comparison. And yet, 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 the God of the universe, the scientist, if you like, invites us to know him more and more and to have a higher and higher view of him, a more accurate view, if you like. We don't just have the microscope tube, thankfully, to look through. We've got his word, the Bible, to try and understand him more, knowing that we could never fully understand him because he's infinitely greater than us. How we think about God is critically important. In 1961, A.W. Tozer wrote a brilliant book called The Knowledge of the Holy, writing about the attributes of God. And he wrote this, he said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Were we able to extract from any man a complete answer to the question, what comes into your mind when you think about God, we might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that man. He goes on later on to say this, and uh, if you've got pen and paper, I'd encourage you to write this next quote down. He said, we tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. So I'd like to put to you today that we could never know God as he truly is because we far smaller than the ant and he's far greater than the scientist. But we can have a high view of God that's constantly growing and developing, or we could have a low view of God that's not growing very much and kind of stays static or even worse, shrinks. And depending on how you and I view God, what our true thoughts are, our true understanding is of what he's like in himself, Tozer said brilliantly that we could predict the spiritual future of ourselves, of our churches, of our communities based on how we view God, whether we've got a high view of Him or a low view of Him. 
The difficulty is that we never truly know him ultimately because he's not like anything we already know. And yet in this journey of getting to know him better, I'd like to suggest that having a low view of God looks something like this. Is where we reduce God in our minds to something we can understand. When I say reduce God, I'm not saying so, he, he cannot be reduced. But we, we generate a mental picture of God that is very small. A low view of God exalts logic and emotion to a higher place than God. In other words, we put logic and emotion in an idolatrous place. I'm speaking here inside the church as well as outside of the church. Christ followers and obviously non-Christ followers. But it's possible in the pursuit of our relationship with God that we put our own logic about the Bible, our own logic about our lives and about our world, or our own emotions, our own feelings about things. We put them in a higher place than what God is truly like. Our view of Him is low enough that our emotions or our thoughts can dictate our future rather than our view of God. When this happens, people with a low view of God, we end up tending to view God through one of these, if I could call them stereotypes. We, we could view him possibly as a tolerant Santa Claus type of figure who is always generally kind, is ho, 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 eager to give presents to the good children and consequences to the bad, but doesn't really have the, what it takes to sort out the problems in the world. Doesn't really have what it takes to make things right. Doesn't have all power. Or we have a low view of God that suggests that he's the genie in the lamp. I'm borrowing from the story of Aladdin here. Where Aladdin finds this lamp, he rubs it, this genie appears to him and says, you've got three wishes. Now, we might not use those words, but if we've got a low view of God, we could approach him like this. As God is at our beck and call and prayer is like rubbing the lamp and God in our minds appears and says, how can I help achieve your every wish to make you happy and comfortable and content? That's a very low view of God. Another low view of God is just to view Jesus as my boyfriend. Who's there just to make me feel nice about myself and kind of give me little gifts and just whisper sweet little nothings. And some of our songs reflect this low view of God. If I say oh, I'm speaking some broader songs in the Christian community, which is just very much like it's just based on my feelings and Jesus, how you make me feel. And it's so nice that we can, these are my own words, dance off into the sunset hand in hand together. God is so much bigger than those mental pictures, that low view that so many Christ followers have of him. What does a high view of God look like? Well, I'd, I'd like to suggest that it's a view where we are constantly reminding ourselves of his attributes. A high view of God is one in which we're constantly grappling with mystery. Because he is infinitely bigger than we can ever know. There's always going to be mystery involved when it comes to our interactions with Him. And if I'm not grappling with mystery, I tend to oversimplify and that produces a low view of God. And having a high view of God is understanding that we will never fully understand everything there is to know about Him. We will never fully understand all that God is. The difference between the low view and the high view. I'd like to go back to my story about going for a walk this morning. If you were to walk outside and to look at the sun and look at it directly, what are you actually seeing? Well, interestingly, the light that left the sun's surface takes 499 seconds. That's just over eight minutes to travel from the sun's surface all the way to earth. So what I'm seeing is not the sun. I'm seeing the radiance or the light, the rays from the sun as they strike my eyeball. As it hits my eye, it's actually left the sun eight minutes ago. So I'm seeing what the sun was like eight minutes before, but because it's so bright and intense, I can't see behind that light to see what the sun is like without very special equipment that I obviously don't have. And when it comes to looking at God, to thinking about God, he's got this radiance that travels out, if you like, from him. I'm using human language here. But the Bible refers to that radiance as God's glory. The sun's light shines out in every direction. Only a tiny fraction of it ever hits the earth's surface. But the sun continues just to shine extravagantly. And the majesty and the uniqueness, the incredibleness of what God is like, only a tiny fraction of it will ever strike our lives. 
And yet the greatness of God will continue to shine forever and forever, from ever past till forever future and everything in between. He is so awesome and so magnificent. And it is our joy and our duty and our journey to discover as much about this amazing God as we can possibly know. In the Westminster Confession of Faith, there's a, a question uh, posed in their shorter catechism, and it says this, what is the chief end of man? What is the reason that you and I exist? And the answer that it gives is brilliant. I can't think of a better answer. What is the chief end of man? Their answer was this, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Or to put it another way, our greatest design, our greatest purpose is to know God and enjoy Him forever. Now, I guess I'm speaking to a whole lot of people. You, everyone watching this, chances are you're a Christ follower already. But I'm trying to stir us into coming to know more of what God is like and being on this journey, never plateauing, never shrinking, never moving back. You see, when it comes to this question, what is the chief end of man? John Piper, very interestingly, he said, why don't we change the question and ask this, what is the chief end of God? Why does God exist? And we can't possibly answer that fully. But many people with a low view of God answer something like this. God's chief end is to glorify man and to enjoy him forever. Why does God exist? Well, of course, he exists to make my life better. He exists to make the world a happy place. He exists to rescue us from all this pain and suffering. Well, Piper suggests maybe the answer is better phrased like this, is that God's chief end is to enjoy God. Sorry, God's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. God is so passionate about His own glory. He is God-centered. He wants our praise. He wants our relationship. He doesn't exist for our good, although He does bring us benefits, but we exist for His glory and for His fame. In Isaiah chapter 48, we find possibly some of the most God-centered verses in the Bible. And as I write this, he says, for my, this is quoting God, by the way, for my own name's sake, I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise, I hold it back from you. So as not to destroy you completely. Verse 11, for my own sake, for my own sake, I do this. How can I let myself be defamed? I will not yield my glory to another. This is an amazing verse. God is saying the reason that he holds back his wrath, the consequence of human sin from breaking out into the world, is for the sake of his own glory. In another verse in Isaiah, he speaks about saving people for the sake of his glory. The reason God saves people and the reason he condemns people is for the sake of his glory. God is God-centered and he's not arrogant. For him to be anything else would be sinful and God can never sin because he's ultimately holy. But he invites every single one of us into this journey with him of coming to know him more and more and us becoming more and more God-centered in our life and in our leadership and our preaching in the way that we do things. When people that have studied a whole lot more than me on, these, on this subject come to kind of listing some of the different aspects of God's character and his makeup, for lack of better words, they use the word attribute, as in we can study the attributes of God. It's a very limited word, but I'm not sure of a better one. And a few years ago, I went on a journey of beginning to study some of the attributes of God from the Bible and from some other books and, and trying to make it part of my if I could word it like this, part of the air in which I carried out my life and my leading, my doing of theology, both in church paid ministry, but just in life and in my family, etc. That my, my first question to myself when trying to understand new things was, what does God think about this? What is this teaching me about God? And then secondly, how can I grow and how can I learn from this? 
Now I've, I've got a list of a whole lot of these attributes that I've, I've kind of drilled into at various times and tried to study and, and sometimes used for teaching. And, and I'd like to just read through a list of 20. Chances are you aren't going to be able to write all of them down and that's okay. But just to give you a little bit of an idea of what I'm talking about here. God is living. Secondly, God is personal. Thirdly, God is spirit. Fourthly, God is infinite. Number five, God is eternal. No beginning, no end. God is self-existent. Number seven, God is unchanging. Number eight, God is all-powerful. Number nine, God is all-knowing. Number 10, God is everywhere. Those are the three omnis that I've just read out. Omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Number 11, God is sovereign. Number 12, God is holy. Number 13, God is righteous or just. Number 14, God is jealous. Number 15, God is wrathful. Number 16, God is love. Number 17, he is gracious. Number 18, he is merciful. Number 19, he has loving kindness. Number 20, God is good. I'm pretty sure that as I've read out different words there, there's some of those that you've interacted with and that mean a lot to you. But maybe there's others, other aspects of what God is like that you haven't interacted with this with that much. I'd like to read you an incredible verse from 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 that gives us great promise and great encouragement when it comes to knowing more of what God is really like. It says this, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. Now that unveiled faces is a reference back to Moses, had to wear the veil over his face because of the glory. He says, But we, New Testament believers, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. Some versions of the Bible say behold. Either way, to contemplate, you've got to be beholding. You've got to be looking at God's glory. Paul says this. He says, as we look at his glory, we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, I'd like you to, to take something from this verse, please. God is who he is. He can never change. But as I engage on a lifetime journey of getting a higher and higher view of him, of looking at him, contemplating him, trying to understand more of his attributes, figuring out more of what he's like, this verse tells me that I get transformed in the process. As I'm thinking about God and trying to figure out more of him, something happens to me. I change. I metamorphosize. I transform. And another thing happens is that I begin to reflect that glory into the world because I'm transforming. Some of God's glory reflects off my life in the same way that the sun's rays reflect off the moon back onto the earth. And I become a little mini moon reflecting some of God's light and God's glory into the world around me. So I'd like to ask in my final few minutes, how do we develop a higher view of God. All of us in some way have got low views of God that need to be grown and need to increase. And I'd like to suggest three things. Number one is to ask this question. What does this teach me about God? What does this teach me about God? Now, I didn't say where to ask that question or when to ask that question. And it's pretty much as often as you can. One of the good places to ask that question is when reading the Bible. Very often when we read the Bible, our starting point can be, well, what does this first teach me about me? Or how does this first make me a better leader? Or if you're a preacher, what can I get from this verse to share this coming Sunday or next week or next month? What if our first question was to ask, how does this help me understand God better? In circumstances that we go through, we can ask the question, what am I learning about God through this? In hardships, we can ask this question, what aspect of God's character can I only know here that I can't know in the good times? There's aspects of God's comfort and his peace that we don't get to see during the good times. But in the valleys, 
we come to know that deep, another aspect of his character than we did before. Whenever we read in the Bible words like this, Lord God Almighty, let's not just go over those phrases, but pause and think, Lord God Almighty means he's all-powerful. When you read in the Bible, God Most High, that's the Bible way of saying he's infinite and he's limitless. God Most High equals a limitless, free God with infinite everything. Number two, how do we develop a higher view of God? Is to make a study of his attributes. Make a study of his attributes. That's in essence what all theology is. Of course, starting point, the Bible. But there's also two books that I'd like to recommend in this regard. The first one is probably one of the most recommended Christian books ever. It's one of the great classics. It's written by a guy named J.I. Packer, and it's called Knowing God. It's a profound book. I don't think you'll read it all in one go. Two or three pages at a time. It's so densely packed with amazing truth, talking about the attributes of God, chapter by chapter. And then another one I referenced it early, earlier was by A.W. Tozer. It's called The Knowledge of the Holy. Both of them quite thin books, but packed with two men that have made a study, made writing down the attributes of God. I'd like to speak for a moment to anyone who's a fellow preacher as I am. If at any point you feel like you're running out of material or you're reaching the bottom of the bucket, it's a good idea just to loop back to some of the attributes of God and say, what can I learn about God and from which verses in the Bible? Those 20 attributes that I've listed on occasion I've taken some of them and made them into a preaching series over five or six weeks, tackling one or two attributes per message. You see, all of those 20, that list of 20 that I, I read out earlier, every single one of them is an entire message all by itself, a 30-minute sermon at least. In fact, any one of those characteristics of God could be an entire series. But if we're not drilling down into that stuff, then we could very easily be tempted to just go to the stuff that's kind of most current or most, um, most the easiest pickings that are there and uh, most easy to, to talk about. Preaching about the attributes of God in some ways gives people the tools to engage and interact and to know this God in a much deeper way, which is what we all need. And thirdly and finally is to ask him for help. How do we get to know God better? We ask him to help us. It says this in Ephesians 1. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. My prayer for you, Paul is saying, is that you would know Him better. I have had the privilege of being married for the last 18 years to an amazing, amazing lady, my amazing wife, Jax. At some points in our relationship, it has been fantastic and I feel like we've clicked beautifully. And there have been occasional moments where I haven't had a clue. I haven't understood her and she hasn't understood me. And we've had things we've had to work through and figure out. And I guess most marriages are like that. I have been down on my knees on occasion saying, God, please help me to understand my wife. I don't get it. I don't understand what's how she's thinking, what's happening here. I'm pretty sure she's been doing exactly the same thing about me. God, please help me understand my husband. I don't get him. I don't understand why he's... Now, that's my closest human relationship, and I should be asking God for help to understand. But an even greater relationship is my relationship with God. And Paul shows us that we can ask him, God, please help me that I can know you better. I can't do this with my own brain. I need your revelation to understand your wrath and your jealousy and your love and your kindness, your mercy, your grace, your infinity, your eternal nature, being all powerful. Oh, it blows fuses on my brain. God, please help me. I want to know you more and more and more. So, in closing, how high is your view of God? And where is your view of God too low? Doesn't bring him any glory. Every single one of us should be on a journey of coming to know him more and more, developing a higher and higher and higher view of him until we're with him one day in eternity. 1 Timothy 1 verse 17. 
now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.